So hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar. This is Civil Liberties, Privacy and Public Health, Emerging Tensions and Technologies During COVID-19. My name is Matt Bailey. I'm the Digital Freedom uh, Program Director for PEN America. Today, PEN is honored uh, to be co-sponsoring this event with the Georgetown Free Speech Project. I'm delighted to have Sandy Unger here as our uh, moderator. And, uh, Sandy, do you mind waving again, just for good, uh, Good effect. Okay. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with our work, with the work of our organizations, uh, we encourage you to check it out after today's session. This is PEN America's fourth online forum in our webinar series, Free Speech and the Virtual Campus. The series builds on PEN's overall commitment to defend free expression, advance diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to dispel all hatreds. Today, we're here to talk about surveillance, COVID and campuses. Uh, the pandemic and our global response to it are posing numerous ethical and public policy dilemmas. Prominent among them is the need to reconcile competing public interests in robust surveillance to monitor and predict the spread of the virus, uh, and at the same time, uh, to protect citizens' civil liberties, rights to privacy, free expression, and free assembly. Uh, this question, this overall question, has become particularly salient for higher education as colleges and universities debate reopening in the fall semester. I'm very excited about our panelists, so before we go any further, I'd like to make some introductions. Each of our panelists is a leading voice on these issues in their own right, and so while I'll very briefly introduce them here, uh, I'd invite each of you to fire up your VPN if you've got one, open up your most secure web browser, and duck, duck, go their names. Um, so without further ado, uh, we've already made poor Sandy wave twice. Um, for the rest of our panelists, if you don't mind waving when I say your name as well, for good um, measure. Uh, Sandy is the director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. Next up, David Cole. David is the national legal director for the American Civil Liberties Union. Eileen Donahoe. Eileen is the Executive Director of the Global Digital Policy Incubator at Stanford University. Robin Green. Robin is the Privacy and Public Policy Manager at Facebook. And uh, Pat Williams. Uh, Pat is the University Distinguished Professor of Law at, and Humanities at Northeastern University. Okay. So we have so much to cover and such a short time together. Um, just a, qu a, qu a quick few housekeeping notes before I hand it off to Sandy and the panel. Um, first of all, closed captioning is available. Uh, you should see a prompt that allows you to turn it on. If you don't, there should also be a closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and you can click enable subtitles. Uh, Secondly, broadly speaking, we're going to divide our um, time into two parts. First, we'll um, go into a moderated panel session with, um, led by Sandy. And then secondly, time permitting, we'll do a Q&A session to which everybody who's attending today is invited to participate. You should also, near that closed caption button, see a Q&A button. Um, you can use that to type in your questions. And you can also use that to upvote similar questions. I see somebody's already helped out by mentioning that we needed uh, Pat's video, which we've now got. So that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so please feel free to just put anything that you um, that comes to mind in there. And if you have questions for specific panelists, please feel free to address them that way as well. Uh, after the Q&A, we'll do very, very quick closing remarks and uh, hand it off to Sandy for closing words. I want to thank all of our panelists in advance for navigating through our new digital reality, for hazarding a Zoom call, and uh, helping us explore these questions today. With that, I will hand it over to Sandy. Thank you very much, Matt. And again, I join you in appreciating the time and the efforts uh, of all our panelists from who all come very highly qualified. Quick word, the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University is tracking challenges to First Amendment values and particularly free speech around the country. We have uh, been doing so for about three years now and have traced about 313 episodes or, or circumstances so far, growing every day, hard to keep up with it. 
We're not having opening statements today because the time is so limited, but we're going to plunge right into our discussion. And I want to turn to Robin Green from Facebook first. To We know she represents Facebook, not Apple and Google or Google, but wonder if she might do us the favor of explaining the Apple Google initiative and in contact tracing that has begun to attract a great deal of attention. As recently as this week, the United Kingdom said they want nothing to do with it. They're not going to use it. But it seems to be emerging in this country as a favorite option. What can you tell us about it briefly, Robin? Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me for this important discussion. I'm, I'm very glad to be able to, to join. Um, so I just want to reiterate what, what Sandy first said, which is that uh, this is an, an Apple-Google endeavor, um, and it is, um, it's not something that Facebook's participating in. Um, and so most of what I'm going to describe, really all of what I'm going to describe it, is uh, from publicly available information um, from the, uh, the two companies that are building these tools, Apple and Google, from their public announcements and from reporting on those announcements. Um, and so in short, what Apple and Google are working together to do um, is to build, um, in the first phase at least, an, um, an API, uh, which is basically an interface that apps can, can get onto in order to um, help do contact tracing. This is um, meant to help with exposure notification. Um, and what they're doing is using um, a model based on proximity measurements um, that derive from uh, Bluetooth signals. And uh, they are they are doing this in order to be able to tell whether or not someone was in close proximity to, to one another to see if their Bluetooth signals were, were basically connecting together. And what they're uh, doing is trying to um, roll this out in a really thoughtful, I think, and, and privacy protective way. Um, although we really need to wait and see um, what the, the API looks like and, and what the code looks like before we can really analyze um, how this turns out. But in the, the plans that have been disclosed, um, they are going to work towards making sure that people's identifiers are anonymized so that people's uh, identity isn't disclosed um, if they do wind up uploading um, you know, their, their COVID status. Um, and then if they do upload their COVID status and their uh, Bluetooth signal is close to someone else's, it would provide a notification, not of, you know, who or where you were when you were in close proximity to someone who had, who had been reported um, or self-reported as, uh, as COVID positive, but, um, but just that you had been exposed. Um, and I'm sorry. Uh, this is voluntary. Isn't that right? That's People right. Opt in or not, personally, they're doing it as a public service when they, when they decide to do that. Um, I mean, I, I suppose that's one way to look at it. I think people may choose to, to do it for many reasons. Um, and I, I won't sort of venture to guess what okay. the motivations are. Um, but, you know, I think the, the key is that, that, you know, the tool is meant to intend um, a mechanism uh, whereby you can take manual contact tracing um, and sort of make it a digital form that is is quite different, um, but that you know will help to inform people about you know if they may have been um, in proximity of someone who is uh, who was COVID positive. Um, and so you know I think I think there are a lot of uh, discussions happening right now about um, about things like efficacy and, and privacy and things like that. It looks like Google and Apple have been quite thoughtful about that. Um, but right. like I said, they haven't uh, released the full API yet. I, I believe that we'll be getting some, some measure of the uh, tools were made available to developers earlier this week. And uh, at the end of the week, I, I think I, I saw a right. report that said that they might release some source code for, for testing. So I'm sure many technologists, I'm a lawyer, so I won't be <laughs> looking at the source code myself. Well. But many I'd technologists, like, I'm sure, will be eager to, to do their own assessments. I'd like to ask the two lawyers among us, David Cole and Pat Williams, if they have any concerns. Are there legitimate privacy concerns about something like this, even though it is presumably anonymous and participation is voluntary? Yeah, so, you know, I think that... Um, Google and Apple and others who are engaged in this uh, uh, enterprise, including the MIT uh, team, are um, 
are trying to uh, address privacy concerns. And, you know, it's not just because they actually, you know, might think privacy is, is a good value, uh, but because privacy is actually critical to this thing working, if it's going to work. It's only going to work if people voluntarily, you know, get the app, put it on their phone, keep their phones with them, uh, you know, uh, trigger when they have been tested positive, you know, upload their data to, to, to the, 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 uh, the entity that can then notify others who they've been in contact with, right? That will not happen unless people are convinced that this is protecting their privacy, that it is anonymized, and it, it can be, and it, it is in, in, the, in the current iterations that I've uh, uh, un, you know, been told about, um, that the information will not be available to the government, that it will not be in a central repository, that it will not be used for any purpose other than this particular purpose. All of those requirements, which are critical to serving privacy, are also critical to this thing being effective in any way, shape, or form because it requires people to buy in, and people are not going to buy in if they don't trust it. Pat, Massachusetts is doing very aggressive contact tracing. You live in Boston, and right now you're muted, so if you could unmute your, your microphone right now, then I'd like to know what you, there we are. Yes, uh, I mean, I, I worry um, that uh, anonymizing a particular app is not the same, uh, is, is not a particular, is not a, an absolute guarantee because there are so many databases and so many sources of information that it's relatively easy, I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, to compare um, even de anonymized data and reveal identities. And I am very unclear as to what the barriers or boundaries um, for anonymization would be in this particular instance. And so it would be nice to see once it's really rolled out exactly what those protections might be. Um, I am a great fan of contact tracing in Massachusetts because as proposed, it relies more on, on telephone calling. And in that sense, it is, uh, I think, involves much more or invites more of a trust factor um, because it is human to human, it's done by telephone, and it is therefore uh, much more far reaching than something which relies upon a voluntarily downloaded app um, in a world, and this really is a pervasive socioeconomic affecting where everybody has access to cell phone or storage or ability to download these apps and therefore in an invisible way it really is self-selecting for those people who can um, and do have the technology um, uh, to access this and this and, and contract tracing is only going to work if it involves widespread population analysis thank you Eileen uh, do you have any concerns about how the data collected through surveillance of this sort will be monitored and if necessary controlled? Absolutely. I mean, it's, and it's not just the Google Apple um, experiment. It's all of the various types of, you know, new mass surveillance of health data, but, and contacts and, um, there are inherent risks to privacy that come from that type of data collection. Um, and I will also say it's not just privacy, that when you erode privacy, you are, you are putting at risk all other forms of civil liberties, including free expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, freedom of movement. The very basic idea being that um, if you are being tracked and monitored in all these ways, it will have a chilling effect on everything you do. Um, now, all of that said, um, the fact that there is a collection of health data or contact tracing happening through new digital apps on its face does not necessarily mean those things are illegitimate. Uh, I think it's really important for people to understand, I come at this um, as an international human rights lawyer, 
And I think that's a, a really useful framework in the context of a global pandemic where this is you know, transborder and we having a global framework is really helpful. But within that human rights framework, what people don't often understand is that um, liberty and security actually go together and that there are existing process principles that are baked right into the core covenant on civil political liberties, ICCPR, with respect to each of those civil liberties um, that basically provide a basis for analysis of when incursions on those civil liberties may be permissible. And it's, those process principles are the necessity, proportionality, legit, you know, it's gotta be toward a legitimate aim, legality. I'm sure we can get into the, what do those principles look like in practice? But I think people need to understand the hard question and the real question is how to simultaneously combat the virus and protect public health which is explicitly listed in the covenant as a legitimate reason to potentially infringe on liberty at the same time that you protect liberty to the max and you do it through that set of process principles. And I think everybody needs to get out of the, you know, preconceived notions that these things are in only intention, they have to go together. So, and especially in a, in a crisis context. Well, President Trump has used, I'm sorry, go ahead, David. You need to unmute yourself or someone needs to unmute you. Okay, yeah, I was just gonna say, um, you know, I think that's right to some degree. I also think it's um, more complicated um, in the sense that in some ways, um, we are measuring here when we think about, for example, contact tracing we are measuring not liberty versus health or liberty versus security, but liberty versus liberty. That is, there are liberty issues and concerns on both sides. If you don't have contact tracing, if you can't identify people who are <coughs> infected and then uh, warn the people who might have then been infected, then what, what we're left with is what we're living in right now which is an incredible intrusion on our liberties, right? We can't go out, we can't go to work, we can't go to concerts, we can't see our friends. I mean, we, I've never lived in a less free uh, environment than I do right now. If, you know, if the question is, you know, can we end that and create some, you know, re resurrect some of the liberties that we are, we've all taken for granted for so long by some, uh, sacrifice in privacy or some other liberty, you know, that we have to make that judgment. It's not a, it's not like, you know, uh, th there are, there are real trade-offs on both sides of the coin here. And that's why I think what makes it so difficult. But of course, enough people have to make that trade-off, have to make that judgment in order for it to work. And, and many people, I don't really think we know the numbers in any way, but a lot of people have, directly flouted the regulations and gone to the beach and marched in protests against the stay-at-home orders and so on. And uh, we have, we have a, a, I think, a confusion for the public, for some people at least, whether to comply or not. President Trump uses the war metaphor, except when he doesn't, except when he encourages people to, to uh, Object and so I, I wonder how, if any of us have a, a clue about how the average citizen is supposed to deal with all these conflicting bits of advice and and we'll get to the we'll get to the, some of the more specific constitutional threats in a moment. Eileen. Yes. Um, so first off, I, it, just in response to David, absolutely. Just because there are process principles doesn't mean applying them and coming out with the right answer is easy. And there isn't a, a, a clear answer in every case. To the, the question that was just asked, um, I think a big part of the problem is that there isn't any of that analysis going on. That governments are just enacting emergency measures all over the world, you know, using new forms of mass surveillance. 
and they're not articulating really anything in terms of why those things are necessary, what's happening with the data, um, and when they'll be, you know, sunsetted, and there's a lot of other checks that should be put in place. But the starting failure is to not do any kind of human rights-based analysis where you look at the implications for civil liberties. And I do think that's what's happening in the United States with protesters, along with all kinds of new forms of disinformation and propaganda intentionally trying to see discontent. You know, that, that, that's another aspect of this very challenging context. I will also say, get back to David's point about, yes, it's, it is not simply a tension between public health and liberty, but that at least start there. I think the public needs to understand um, what an efficacious response that is adequately tailored to the context looks like. And then I, we could go into all the types of liberty tensions that are new in our digitized world. Um, and the, you know, the right to democratic participation um, and the integrity of our elections is now being pitted against free expression. I mean, there's so many liberty, liberty tensions as well. But in this context, there are some reasons to keep some pieces of it simple. And none of that articulation is coming out of the White House, much less around the world. Robin, uh, Facebook is very familiar with some of these debates and arguments and, and uh, contest between different values. How, how is Facebook making sense of this right now? Is it being careful to uh, advise cautious compliance with things? Or is it worried about regulation emerging over time from yet one more issue? So, I mean, I think that the, the way that we're approaching this is just really looking for the ways that we can be most impactful and be a part of the solution. Um, and so when we look at this, it's really about um, what are we well situated to do? And so I think one of the really important things that, that we're focusing on is making sure that we get really good, credible information to, to all of our users. Um, we have billions of, you know, over a billion people who, who use our services every month. And so being able to, you know, work with the Centers for Disease Control, the, um, the World Health Organization, um, and other health authorities um, to make sure that, that folks who are in countries that are affected um, are able to access, you know, what is the information that they need about how to keep themselves safe, how to keep themselves healthy. Um, and, and we're also very serious about the, the important responsibility that we have to make sure that we do address misinformation issues. Um, and so in addition to working um, with, you know, the DC and W I'm getting incredible information, we work with over 60 independent uh, fact checkers globally um, and are really aggressively looking for misinformation about the virus. Um, and, and to that end, just in March alone, for example, um, we took down hundreds of thousands of pieces of misinformation related to the virus. Um, and we also were able to apply warning labels to 40 million pieces of content, just um, on 4,000 fact checker articles. Um, we're really taking this responsibility. Pat, I, I wonder if I could ask you to drill down a little bit on some of these concerns about, about surveillance. Um, I was, uh, it's impossible to know sometimes where you've read what these days, but I noticed this morning that uh, it's being pointed out that cell phone location data is showing people moving about more, moving around. And that's how we know it's not just an anecdotal thing, but we know from cell phone location data that more people are moving around than are supposed to be or are, are being asked to be. Um, it's, I suppose, constructively useful to know that now, but how will it be exploited later when we can, if we can narrow it down to just which cell phones are moving around and, and where they're going? You're, you're on mute, sorry. Oh, there we go. There you um, go. I, I think that part of the root of the distrust as well as the incoherence of this moment is that we are 
being governed largely by non-governmental entity and rather private companies. Um, and that's part of the confusion here. So if one of the reasons I have more trust in the Massachusetts system is that it's a public-private partnership, but it relies on public health principles that are rooted in the government of the state. And we forget the degree to which we once had a public health infrastructure. And that's where some of this governance ought to be coming from um, because it is bound by a set of rules to a common uh, good, a common wealth, as we call the state of Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> when you have, but, but that's literal. I mean that in a, in a literal sense. And you balance individual freedoms against that common fate. And uh, the intrusion upon those individual liberties is always a balancing act. And Massachusetts is one of the first states that, you know, that, that litigated this back in 1905 over small talk, smallpox vaccinations, the ability to have those balances. Um, but when you have a company, um, Amazon and Google, which are, you know, for better or for worse, profit driven, um, and they're existing in a kind of free for all of uh, monetized data where uh, uh, you know, there, there, is, there are incentives um, um, to breach those walls, there is also going to be, I think, very legitimate distrust in the absence of any attempt or to successfully legislate some barriers, some boundaries. This is different, for example. I mean, just compare what we do with the census. There is a law census workers will go to jail <laughs> if they reveal any of the private information. We don't have that. Um, I, with all due respect to Facebook, I mean, the idea that you feel a responsibility is not the same as having a legal obligation for which there is some um, actual um, outcome. I am very, very distressed that the technology is, again, this competitive free-for-all in which you have things like I read an article about Westport, Connecticut, whose police department has purchased a drone that at 150 feet can apparently take people's temperatures and read their, um, their heart rate and so forth. And the problem with that is not the technology. It might be wonderful to have a distance technology to be able to see who has a fever or not. It's that it is within the police department. And so it's surveillance. And if so, you have a series of police rules that then take you to jail, for example, for it, what is the consequence of having that technology and that data located there as opposed to in a public health situation where we then immediately come in with a team of doctors as opposed to a SWAT team? And it's, the, it's that category mistake of where this technology's monetized data ends up that makes people distrustful and that's why I think at this point in our crisis, we need to get real social workers, real public health workers on the phone, talking to people in a humane and patient way, talking about the common good and collecting this data in a way that's responsible and, uh, and protected. Before we turn to another phase of the program today, I just want to ask you, Pat, about these phone calls. Some of us are so accustomed now to hanging up on on yeah. unwanted anonymous callers at dinner time or, 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 or whenever, even on our cell phones these days, how are contact tracers going to get through that barrier that so many of us have? Our governor, our governor is actually uh, is, is working, and it ought to be simpler, and yet somehow it isn't, to get the phone companies and the technology providers to have a little flash that says, mask of COVID-19, please answer. And so it wouldn't just be a so phone. So that would be a more benign call it would be a more coming benign. in on your phone yeah, then. And actually, I mean, and, and, you know, taking data from phone calls is much more protected, actually, than the Bluetooth kinds of uh, alternative proposals uh, uh, through ones, through the other, through, through apps on one cell phone. Um, I think it's not necessarily an either or. I think it actually needs to be a both and. Um, there are definitely, as, as Pat points out, there are a lot of people who don't have the, uh, the, the kind of the phones aren't going to get the apps, etc. And so if you only rely on contact tracing, you're going to miss out a significant part of the country and particularly underprivileged people. Um, on the other hand, 
if you rely solely on you know people actually making phone calls identifying actual people then asking them what they remember or don't remember about you know who they came into contact with their memories are obviously going to be very faulty uh, that actually discloses a lot more personal information than the contact tracing app which only which doesn't identify location doesn't identify the, uh, the names of people, it simply assigns a number to um, one phone and another, randomly generated numbers, and then uh, lists um, through those numbers which phones have been near the person who was, um, who was contacted. So you don't need a person to identify the people, call the people, et cetera. So, you know, I think it's really got to be both ends. I think there's, I wouldn't rule out the uh, contact tracing apps. I also wouldn't you know, put tremendous faith in them because we haven't yet seen whether they can actually work in an effective way. Um, but I think that we, you know, we may not well need to do both. And if we're going to do both well, we need to be conscious about the privacy concerns that are raised both by the human beings who are calling and, and doing contact tracing and the apps that are doing contact tracing. Andy, like if jump in just on the question that uh, Pat raised about what's happening to all this data in the hands of the private sector and, you know, the tension with what should be the public interest and no guarantees about it. Uh, I think that's why, you know, in the necessity proportionality framework, there are, there are important checks on what go happens to all that data that could be put into place, whether it's being collected by government or the private sector. And it, you know, it's like, why is it necessary? What, how is it being minimized? So it's, it's proportional to the threat. Who has access to it? What is the purpose? It must be tied to the public health purpose and combating that threat. Where is it stored? How is it secured? And most interesting proposal to your point about law enforcement is ensuring that that newly connected data related to health or contacts in the health context is firewalled from other data that is used for law enforcement or immigration purposes or other government purposes. And so I think that there are some practical things that can be done at the same time that the data is collected for purposes of combating the pandemic. Yeah, and I, I would just say that as far as from what I know, they're actually responding to those concerns precisely, not creating a central repository not giving access to, uh, to outsiders, making it voluntary, uh, using this number uh, yeah. regime so that you don't, you can't actually de-anonymize it. Um, it's, they've been pretty, and I think, you know, I, I, as I said before, I think it's because, partly because they believe in privacy, but principally because they recognize that unless people are uh, convinced that this is going to not screw them in one way or another uh, from a private perspective. They're just not going to get, not going to use it. And then it's definitely not going to work. Right. Sandy, it looked like you dropped for a moment. We've just continued to address your last question and these sort of competing uh, governance issues for manual data collection versus contact tracing approaches. Uh, Matt, sorry for my absence for technical reasons. I'm back. I want to switch us for a moment to the discussion of some of the specifically enumerated First Amendment freedoms that some people have felt are being challenged by the stay-at-home orders, for example. And they say their right to assemble is being compromised in the name of public health. And we've seen this breakout all over the country. And at some time, at some moments, subtly or not so subtly encouraged by the president as well. How do we deal with what appear to be legitimate concerns about First Amendment freedoms to get together, to present grievances, to associate with other people? How do, how do we handle that in this, in this moment? David? So, yeah, so, you know, we, we've, uh, we, we're you know, monitoring the situation. I think, you know, our, our, and, and we have challenged uh, some instances in which states have gone uh, further than we think is appropriate. But by and large, our view is, of course, the right to assemble has been restricted. Of course, the right of association has been restricted. Of course, the right to gather 
and worship religiously has been restricted. Of course, your right to hang out with your friends, you know, in a in a in a park with you know uh, in a large group has been restricted, but it's justified, and it's justified by the you know uniform public health consensus that this is the way. This is really the only way at this point that we save lives, that we flatten the curve, that we reduce uh, contagion. And, and, and that's a justify. So yes, it's an intr intrusion. As I said before, I've never lived in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where my liberties are more intruded upon. But I think, and, and we at the ACLU think, that you know, for the most part, these are, these are uh, warranted uh, at, at the moment. And you know, they, of course, they can go too far. There are other countries that have put in place much more restrictive uh, um, conditions on people's ability to even leave their homes. Uh, but, you know, I think this is, I think this has actually been pretty reasonable. And then, and I'll say this too. I think this, unlike say, after 9-11, where, you know, the, the claim was we have to give up liberty to preserve security. But in fact, what was being done was we were requiring Arab and Muslim foreigners to give up their liberty for the security of the rest of us. It wasn't an actual sacrifice of all of our liberties. Here, it is actually a sacrifice of all of our liberties. And I think that's an important check on the government going too far because everybody has an interest in being safe from the virus, but we all also have an interest in being out in the world and, and resuming our, our everyday lives. And so it's unlikely when you have broad-based measures that actually interfere with everybody's liberties, that the government will, in a democracy, that the government will have the, you know, the, the freedom to really go beyond what is justified. And, um, you know, so I, I think you can take some comfort here. It's very different from situations like the McCarthy era where you targeted communists, the civil rights era where you targeted African Americans or the or, or not post 9-11, where you targeted Arabs and Muslims. This is, you know, every one of us is affected by this. That's a good thing, actually, in terms of liberty concerns. Pat? Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, I, I absolutely agree with what's, what David says, but I think part of the danger of this moment is that the, this particular administration has given embodiment to the contagion that isn't about the virus. And so this so-called invisible enemy has been given a face, which is China or people who look like they're from China yeah. or, um, or, or, I mean, these musters on the, of, uh, on the, on the steps of state capitals um, are in defense of the economy, which is suddenly alive and embodied and for which we must lay our lives down. So there's an incredible metaphoric um, architecture at work in which, uh, People are donning, you know, uh, bulletproof vests, and they have these military-grade weapons, and they have no masks. And so it's like the enemy is not just invisible; it has been made even more invisible um, by these uh, uh, these almost religious metaphors or scapegoats um, that uh, uh, that I think are, are are quite distracting and quite harmful in the in 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 both the short term and obviously the long run. Well, I, I know that none of us on this panel is necessarily a health expert, but how will we know, other than the standard things we've heard about flattening the curve and so on, how will we know that the governor of Nebraska, for example, has said we should stop limiting people's ordinary freedoms as soon as possible. As soon as our health systems are not overwhelmed, we should be giving people freedom back. How, what, what, what do you all have to say about this? I mean, are, are you persuaded at all by the demonstrators, by the people at the beach, the people violating that maybe, maybe there's a limit to how well we can depend on voluntary compliance? Eileen? Uh, so, so many different ways to answer that. Number one, I don't think um, the governor of Nebraska I, isolating one factor is the only thing that should be considered mm -hmm. across the country. And so I love the idea that there is expressed concern about civil liberties, that's good. But that rule set, I don't think is that helpful. Um, I also would say that in the context of protesters, again, 
legitimate concerns about liberty. But as David said, when it comes to freedom of assembly, freedom of association, freedom of movement, there are direct impacts on the health, safety, and rights of other people that essentially justify restrictions in this context. But to your earlier question to which David and Pat answered about the First Amendment and the other rights that are implicated beyond, you know, we've talked about privacy. The part that's stunning to me in, in the global context is the number of uh, emergency laws that have been passed around the world that uh, bear on free expression and violations of core right. content not just the First Amendment, but Article 19 in the international context. It is stunning um, that, you know, there's they're criminal, criminalizing misinformation about the disease, um, about tactics taken by governments, the efficacy of those tactics. And there are laws um, you know, criminalizing sources of information that are cited in any public reference to the disease needing to come from government sources or WHO sources. Um, and there are new, you know, in Argentina, there are cyber uh, patrols looking for disinformation about the disease that's cr criminal, you know, penalty up to six years in prison. And so I am very concerned about the um, breadth and vagueness of the, all of these laws criminalizing speech when unlike the context of freedom of assembly association which david indicated you know from a civil liberties point of view can be justified these restrictions on free expression are cannot be they're not necessarily going to be efficacious and they're they're, they're they are um throwing people in jail for misinformation is not the answer um and so um I'm really worried about the free expression dimension of this. I'm going to uh, throw this to Matt in just a moment to uh, see if there's some questions from some of the people attending across the country that he wants to raise with you. Um, I would say, Eileen, that if we had such a law against misinformation in this country, there would be some people in very high places who would be in trouble right now. Yes, so let me be the first to say the disinformation, nonsense, and propaganda coming out of the White House is the worst of the worst when it comes to making the problem worse with dis disinformation. And so that is true, and it must be called out. In the United States, we're not going to criminalize speech coming out of the White House. We better not. <laughs> we won't. And, and, and in fact, it's not the right solution around the world either. That doesn't mean disinformation coming out of the White House is a good thing or even a legitimate thing. And um, I am hoping that this, you know, this form of spouting from the White House has happened since the current occupant got there on a lot of topics. And I'm hoping that this context makes clear how dangerous that is and how much it's not in the public interest. And, you know, he should be called out on that. Matt, do you have some questions from participants that you'd like to put forward? Uh, I sure do. Uh, I thought maybe a, a useful place to start because of course we're, we've had a wide ranging discussion so far, um, bridging as far as international human rights um, as well as Facebook's internal approaches. I thought it might be useful to try to bring it back to campus. Um, so there's a question here from, and everyone will have to forgive me if I get the pronunciation of your, your name wrong, but from Tarina Tourette. Um, they say, I have, I've read that employers, schools, churches, and I think we can add to this universities, uh, uh, might require people to use the Google Apple program in exchange for access into these places. How does this play into the conversation about privacy and access more generally? Um, so I think, you know, as we return to the question I raised at the very top of the, um, the agenda, you know, obviously universities around the world and domestically are thinking about how and, and when to reopen their campuses. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, in particular any of our panelists who spend time in university settings have anything to, to say to that question. I mean, I, I am quite concerned that a lot of what falls within the realm of civil liberties is being and has been well before this uh, pandemic uh, 
um, limited by contract notions. You can't come into our workplace unless you forfeit this or that, including First Amendment rights. Um, and there is, and, and I think that that corporate contractarian way of dealing with what is effectively can be uh, understood as forms of dissent um, is really is is very very problematic, and particularly now where it it, it, it involves biometrics and the body, um, that uh, the, the the new rules saying you can't cross our threshold unless you pass this test as described again, not by a health provider, not by some in, independent uh, um, public health metric, um, but what why but but by what a private employer deems to be the metric um, as devised by a, uh, for example, a temperature taking, which is, you know, may or may not be an indication of coronavirus. Um, and that incoherence, that misapplication, that imprecision, I think is its own danger. I think there could be dangers, but I also think if I were running a university, and I were thinking about reopening in the fall, uh, I would be, you know, irresponsible if I didn't impose certain obligations on the students who came back to the um, to campus to ensure that they don't infect each other, uh, members of the community, of the surrounding community, my uh, faculty who are, you know, many of whom are in a vulnerable group because they're, you know, uh, over 65, etc. Uh, and so here, you know, I don't think there's a I don't think it's uh, unreasonable to um, require a certain set of practices if you want to come back to school. You know, you don't have to come back to school, um, but there's no way in the world that they're going to be able to start school in the fall in the way that it was last fall. You know, they're going to, you know, at a minimum, you're going to have to enforce social distancing. You're not going to be able to have people go to basketball games and, and parties where large groups of people come together. Uh, you're going to have to be able to identify those people who are sick and get them uh, isolated and quarantined so that they don't, you don't create, uh, you know, another hotspot. Um, you know, or the, and the alternative to that, to not requiring that, is, there, you know, online university, which we have all, you know, seen has uh, its, uh, has it, it is, is not, not nearly uh, as, as, as sort of rich as the in-person. So, I just think there are really, really hard choices here, and we can't just be, I mean, I, you know, I head up an organization that fights for civil liberties every day, but I really think, as I said at the beginning, and it's true for the university setting as well, there are liberties on both sides. My kids, who are both very civil liberties conscious, if you ask them, you know, would, would, if you could go back to school in the fall, uh, but you have to, you know, download a contact tracing thing on your phone. I think they'd say, "Sure, let me go back." I mean, I don't want to sit in my house, in my, you know, my uh, children childhood bedroom for the for the entire semester to protect my privacy by not having an app that is that, if it's done the right way, in fact protects my privacy already in terms of the way it's been engineered. So I think it's not an on-off thing at all. But David, I I, I agree with you, except that. The, uh, you know, at least the problem that I thought Sandy was raising is, for example, a Google app that focuses on temperature or has some other metric. And the problem that you're describing really can only be met. I mean, we can never really come together without risk of infection in any numbers, without testing. And until right. we get widespread, universal, reliable testing, None of, an app isn't going to isn't going to be the way we can. No, agreed, agreed. You have to have testing and the app. But then the question is, can you require people to be tested? And you know, I think prob probably you can, as a condition of coming into some congregate setting where if you're not tested, you are a real risk to many other people. Matt, I might mention that uh, Christina Paxson, a very well known president of Brown University in Providence published a piece in the New York Times the other day saying it is possible to reopen colleges and universities this coming fall with testing, tracing, and separating people, uh, quarantining people. And um, I think that as a former small college president myself, this, it's, it's a terrifying notion 
it's an ideal, an idealistic notion that we ought to be able to do it, but mistakes and their potential consequences are something really to worry about, it seems to me. So I think that provides a, a nice opening um, to pivot kind of from this question of consent that I have a feeling we may be coming back to, um, to the question of kind of adoption. Um, so if, you know, a lot of these measures, uh, whether you're talking about consumption of, of good public health information, or you're talking about installation of applications, uh, opting into things, requires a lot of people to actually affirmatively do something. Um, and so Robin, I, I think you, I don't want to put you on the spot for the entire global tech industry again, but I'm afraid I might do it. Um, there's a question here from Haley Byman. She says, uh, they say, modeling studies have shown that COVID-19 spreads too rapidly for manual phone-based contact tracing alone to work. Uh, do we have data on how many Americans um, might be willing to put public health concerns above privacy concerns or conjectures? Uh, and I think there's probably two different ways you could answer the question. The first is if you have a direct answer, that's wonderful, or if anybody does. <laughs> I think the larger question of kind of how is Facebook and how are your, your um, peers thinking about this need to create at scale um, effect, at scale adoption, vis-a-vis, um, -vis, like relative to say um, government led uh, in real life testing regimes. Thanks. Um I mean, I can, I can give sort of a brief and, and probably not very satisfactory answer about, you know, how do Americans feel? And, and my answer to that would just be that um, we have started to see some polling. Um, there was a, a story in the Washington Post yesterday, um, and I know Morning Consult and, um, and some other um, polling entities, I think Harris, have, have also done a lot of polling around sort of how people are feeling um, at a very general level about a lot of the, you know, current restrictions and, and the, you know, risk to, to the health of their loved ones. Um, and amongst those questions are, are questions about how do you feel about, um, about contact tracing and things like that. And it, it shows a, a pretty divided public. Um, and so I, I would just commend those resources to folks who are really curious about how, how people might approach adoption. Um, but I think the, the question of adoption and the consent model is, is really challenging. Um, I think there are some countries that have um, adopted voluntary models um, and then others that have adopted more coercive models. Um, and so what we're trying to do is make sure um, that the way that, that we're thinking about you know, these kinds of apps, and, and again, we're not participating in building um, the, the project that, that Apple and Google are in, engaging in um, or, or contact automated, uh, excuse me, automated contact tracing apps. Um, but we are trying to think about what are the kinds of privacy protections um, and the kind of protections and, and efficacy that it would be required for this to be um, you know, something something worth pursuing. And so we've been working internally to develop, to develop some initial principles around that. Um, and I, I can just say that we found a lot of the resources that privacy experts and technologists have put forward. Um, the ACLU, for example, has published a really great white paper on location data, um, and then a set of principles around automated contact tracing that have been really informative as we've been, you know, developing our, our principles and, and our thinking around, around how to engage in, in this kind of discussion. I mean, I think the next step is, is really to make sure that industry adopts a sort of aligned set of principles around how to treat privacy um, and, and human rights to make sure that, that as this issue does move forward, um, that we have really good protections in place so that, as David was saying, people feel comfortable adopting. And I think that's going to be one of the keys. Um, but I would just offer that there's a lot of focus being placed on audited contact tracing. Um, and I think that there are a lot of other ways that, that we can be using data in really privacy protective ways um, to be able to respond to the pandemic. And so one of the things that we've been really focused on at Facebook is, is really thinking through how can we use our platform and services in order to help governments understand what the disease spread looks like, where, you know, predict where hotspots may be, um, identify where resources need to be allocated, 
um, and things like that. And so to that end, we've been partnering um, with researchers and public universities um, in order to do symptom surveys uh, where people who use Facebook can be invited to take a, a survey about their symptoms. Um, and if they want to do that, they would actually go off of Facebook's platform um, in order to take an anonymous survey um, where they just answer some questions. Um, and it's, it's actually being run by Carnegie Mellon University. And then we're partnering with them um, to help uh, provide some maps of, of what the data that they collect looks like. And they have just started to publish their initial findings. Um, and, and it's been really interesting. It looks very promising as a way of actually predicting um, where hotspots may occur. Um, and again, that's, you know, it's just something where we are able to, to use our reach in order to facilitate the work of researchers um, where they're actually collecting the data. And then we have our Data for Good program, which does really great work um, taking large aggregate data sets um, and using privacy preserving techniques in order to make sure that people can't be identified um, when their data is in, in those data sets and uh, develop disease maps. Um, so these are things like co-location maps that show um, when people are likely to be in different places that can help uh, predict disease spread. Uh, mobility maps that can help to determine whether people are moving a lot or not. Um, and we've taken a lot of steps to make sure that those kinds of tools are really efficacious. Um, we were having over 160 researchers um, who are part of our, our partnerships network. Um, and we're making sure that, that we can get really actionable insights using privacy preserving um, data in, in order to respond to the pandemic. Thank you. And if you don't mind, I'll jump in. I'm going to attempt, I'm going to do a ham-handed job here trying to mush together several of the comments or questions that we have um, remaining just because we're getting close to time. Um, I think that, that the question of the partnerships like the one with Carnegie Mellon that I was reading about um, are really interesting uh, from an ethical framework standpoint um, because you assume uh, that there's a good IRB review on their end happening. There's, a lot, there's kind of a good scaffolding in place to assess how and whether to engage uh, in this research. Um, so that begs the question, how should universities as a whole think about this and to the extent that they're uh, looking at uh, working through partners or with their own internal capacity to stand up uh, surveillance regimes, how should they think about their power? How should they think about uh, even within their um, student body differentials of power between the institution and the, the, um, the enrolled individuals? So it's a broad question, but um, we've had multiple, I think, attacks on it from different directions so far. So I'm just curious um, if anybody would like to jump in. Maybe Eileen, I think you, you're the one who's been the longest since you last had a chance to opine. Oh, oh there are a lot of dimensions to this. Um, first off, I don't think we've adequately looked at the responsibility of universities to faculty and staff who may be older and more vulnerable. And those are members of the community as well. And so students are very important to the enterprise, but they're not the only ones who, uh, whose interests must be considered. Um, and I think that makes it much harder. Um, I also think, going back to the first question on the university setting where Pat talked about the contract model, I think that the, ex the idea of using the app developed by Apple and Google, which people are attracted to for the simple reason that it is voluntary to download the app as well as voluntary to report disease for yourself, um, which is how you're, they're gonna get buy-in. As David said, once you, there's the new twist, if a, if a university, which is not the government, but is a private entity, or it could be a public university, requires it, it changes that whole, um, the dynamic around that original, vision. And I wonder how Google and Apple would feel about that, um, that interplay. Um, so um, I think that this idea, I think the big question in all of these cases is who gets the data for what purpose, for how long, how is it protected? You have to right. worry about private sector getting it, government access to that, and then other private entities research universities getting access to it on what basis and was the original consent and voluntary nature of the 
data collection, is that undermined by those, those partnerships and relationships? And I think that's where you start. Who would write those rules? Say it again. Who, Who would, would write those rules? Of those um, I, I think, you know, it's interesting. I will, I'll, get, I'll just mention, um, I, I, I'm very aware of uh, some of the work done at Microsoft in particular. And since maybe they're not, they're not as much on the hook, it's easier for them to do, but they have a set of privacy principles that are, they've laid out seven privacy principles that are pretty strict on consent and the voluntary nature, the security, the firewalling, you know, the purpose for which data is used, how it's minimized, how the time frame is minimized. And so I think a multi-stakeholder process could be created where you at least come up with those a little bit more granular process principles around privacy in the context of data collection about both health and context. I think that's, we're not that far off, um, but, diff, but people will disagree. You know, some people will say they have to be more liberty protecting and others will say, no, 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 you're undercutting the, the usefulness of the data. It's not easy to, to get, to figure out who gets to decide. Right. But there's a predication there on transparency as a fundamental. Big, that's a big one. That's a big one. And I think we haven't emphasized that enough that the public has to be informed about how the data is being used and how it's being protected. And um, that is a really important part of the process that we tend to underemphasize. I will say just to interject one more point from the, the list of unanswered questions we have here. Um, I think that there are several people who are questioning the very idea of true anonymity, um, which you could put uh, as a, a, a foundational principle for thinking about identity, but you could also say that it's really hard for people to understand their risks in this space. Um, David or, or Pat, do you have any last thoughts on kind of the, the last few minutes of our discussion here? Yeah, I, I do. I do worry that we are tr that, that this part of the discussion really, again, places the governance of this technology within the companies that are producing it. And so, in addition to lack of transparency, you know, where is the right of appeal? Where is the entree for public voice? Um, you know, we have we all know somebody who's been like kicked off these platforms for reasons that may be contestable, but there is no right of appeal. Um, and it seems to me that it's wonderful to have a code of ethics within the company, but that's not the end of governance. And particularly where what is happening with our technological revolution and what has happened very fast is something to go back to the IRB model, which is a form of human experimentation. We're doing these huge global experiments with human behavior and with the ways in which we learn, the ways in which we interact. And there has been no larger inquiry that relates it to the post-World War II conventions about human experimentation. Right. And so I'd really like to take it to that degree that this technology really is, you know, for better or for worse, for all of the benefits it's brought us, <clears throat> um, also, you know, puts right before us huge, huge questions of what it means to be human, what it means to be a free human, what it means to be free from surveillance, and uh, what it means to have the right of appeal against what are effectively, you know, however beneficent <laughs> global monopolies. I just want to add one other thing, sorry, to the right of appeal and also the earlier transparency point is the idea of independent oversight. We often think of that as very important when it comes to a government program, but the same could be said of a university research program and or a private sector company. No, uh, may I, Matt? Uh, just one point, I, everyone sounds so reasonable here and everyone is <laughs> raising wonderful points and the questions from the participants are good too, but then you have well-known public actors who wade into this discussion, like Elon Musk yesterday uh, of Tesla, uh, making the most extraordinary remarks. I mean, that this is, we were forcibly imprisoning people in their homes against their constitutional rights. Uh, I, I'm not saying that Elon Musk has a huge, obvious following, but he's a name that's known. And he weighs in with a very different 
almost irrational sounding perspective. He used the term fascist to describe what was going on. And uh, I just wonder how we keep some of this conversation. I, I, I mean, the, the president of Brown put it differently. She said, on the other side, she says a heavy handed approach to public health may be worth it, may be worthwhile. Now that seems, that seems reasonable, but how do we, how do we do at this critical moment when it, it, it's a life and death matter, how do we keep the discussion rational and constructive? We don't, right? That's the cost of the First Amendment, right? We, right. There is no, there is no uh, authority that we would trust to silence Elon Musk because what he's saying is crazy. And instead, what we have to, you know, the only way we know to respond is through more speech, through the kinds of warnings, uh, you know, that, that Facebook is putting out. And, uh, and Facebook, of course, because it's you know, not the government, can take down uh, statement, disinformation kinds of things. But, but the state can't, right? That's, that is a cost of free speech, that, that irrational people, crazy people, ignorant people, extremist people have just as much right to speak as reasonable people. Well, I agree. I just worry that 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 it's if not Elon Musk, then large companies like Amazon and forgive me, <laughs> Facebook, but you know, but they are our new government to some degree, and so if they want to take it down or put it up, it's really in a power that almost contests um, the the Constitution itself, and that's that what is, me. that's. I said, what yeah. yeah, I agree with you on that. I mean, I think we have to think much more broadly in the long term about how we deal with the governance capabilities and powers that we've sort of ceded to very powerful private actors. In this moment, though, with this crisis, you know, if we are going to wait for Congress to act, forget about it, right? If we're going to wait for you know <laughs> all 50 states to act, forget about it. In fact, the solutions have to be, you know, have to be private and and, and debated in public, but at the, at the end of the day, I think what, what gives me some solace about, at least about the contract tracing stuff, I mean, we, we haven't talked about lots of other civil liberties concerns that are, I think, even greater, is the fact that if the thing is voluntary, then we, the people, are the ultimate check, right? We, if we don't trust it, we won't get on it, and we'll only get on it if it is trustworthy, which requires the transparency, which requires the limitations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to jump in um, and use this example of Elon Musk to go back to what was my original point about the importance of simplicity in messaging around how to do this analysis. It's not just the protesters in Michigan who've been pushed out there by disinformation. Elon Musk is seeing it through a very simple, unnuanced lens. And that tells you something. And, and this is where, um, helping the public understand that there are tensions between things we, we care about, all of which should be protected, but that, that they are in conflict in different contexts. In, in the international human rights law framework, that is the necessity, proportionality, legality framework, and those process principles. Doesn't mean the answer is easy, at least you have a framework that would make government restrictions look in the ballpark of legitimacy rather than outrageous to Elon Musk. In the, in the US, the First Amendment context, the same kind of analysis happens with speech um, under the First Amendment. Nobody, it's not about Elon Musk being silenced, but it is about um, being able to ensure legitimate, narrowly tailored restrictions on liberty. That's the same kind of analysis that happens under the Constitution. If your if fundamental rights are at stake, you have to prove it's narrowly tailored to a legitimate mean, et cetera. And so people just don't understand how much work those process principles can actually do for us. So on that, on that heady note, we've, we've uh, talked about power. Uh, I feel a little bit awkward having been muting and unmuting everyone now, David, I have to say. Uh, we've talked about human rights frameworks. We've talked about sort of the structural role of the state in adjudicating speech. We've looked at the technology sphere. Um, I'd like to hand it back to you, Sandy, to, to land the plane. We have just uh, a waning two minutes on the clock here, but I think you'll make good use of them. 
Right. Well, I think we've had a wonderful discussion, uh, and I'm I'm proud of having done this. It's probably one of hundreds, if not thousands, of such discussions that have to take place in this country. And as David would say, it, that's one of the encumbrances, but one of the encumbrances that keeps us free, hopefully, and that preserves wisdom. Uh, if you want to, if you want a, a, a real time look at just how often free speech is being challenged in this country, please take a look at the website of the Free Speech Project, freespeechproject.georgetown.edu. And it's really shocking. It's not the big things that everybody knows about that, are, that we have to worry about. It's some of the trivial, petty abridgments of free speech that we do have to worry about. And I think, I think we all agree that we have to, though we accept some compromises of our liberties, that we have to watch out how much we compromise and, and what we give away. Uh, Eileen Donahoe, Pat Williams, David Cole, Robin Green, and my uh, partner, Matt Bailey in this enterprise, thank you all very much. Thanks to Penn America, a wonderful organization, and we're proud to partner with them at the Free Speech Project from Georgetown. Thank you, everybody, and a big thank you to everybody who's been listening in and dropping questions in. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in future webinars, and thank you for pre your participation today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.